recording? Just did. You're on it. Thank you. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Amanda Newell. I'm with Cascadia Conservation District and just want to welcome you to the third installment of our Native Planting 101 workshop series. Tonight, we'll be hearing from Julie Sanderson and the topic is managing invasive weeds. Just wanted to give you a little bit of background about Cascadia Conservation District, who we are and what we do. So we're a non-regulatory organization dedicated to encouraging the wise stewardship and conservation of all natural resources in Chelan County. And the way we do that is by working cooperatively with local landowners and communities, and we provide technical and financial assistance for soil, water, forest, fish, and wildlife conservation efforts. So a little more information about the types of projects that we offer, riparian restoration, water conservation. We work with farmers to become salmon safe certified. Uh, we do a lot of wildfire preparedness and wildfire recovery type projects um, and urban agriculture and then education and outreach, both youth and adult education. Um, to learn more about any of our programs, you can check out our website, which is cascadiacd.org or give us a call at 509-436-1601 and we'd be happy to chat with you about any natural resource concerns you have on your property. And then just a quick shout out to the Washington Department of Ecology, uh, it's their logo there and they are providing the funding for us to bring this workshop to you. So with that, oh, couple of upcoming sessions. So um, our last virtual session will be March 28th, so next Monday, at seven and that'll be using native plants for fire resistant landscape around the home. And that'll be with Al Murphy. And then on May 14th, we'll be having an in-person event um, at Derby Canyon Natives. And the sign up sheet, it looks like Kirk just dropped that in the chat. Um, so you'll actually need to sign up for that ahead of time. And it'll be kind of a lottery system as to how many folks are able to make it. Yeah, so adding onto that, so it, it, we're going to have it as a one small group, and so it will be limited um, to 25 people. So it is a lottery. Um, we're not advertising it other than through people who've attended these sessions. So uh, to get signed up uh, for that lottery, uh, drop that form in the uh, chat, and I'll put it in later uh, in the presentation as well. So, um, and for those people who just came in, I'll put it in one more time. Um, so tonight, though, we have uh, Julie Sanderson, and she's going to be talking with us about managing invasive weeds. So Julie is a botanist, and she is the coordinator for the Chelan County Noxious Weed Control Board. Uh, before getting into the weeds, um, Julie worked for eight years with the BLM on rare plant and restoration projects. She taught tax, tax plant taxonomy and biology classes at Wenatchee Valley College. She's a member of the Wenatchee chapter of Washington Native Plant Society, and she holds degrees in botany and plant pathology from the University of Wisconsin. She's been in Washington State and it's been her home for the last 28 years. So Julie, I'll uh, pass it on to you. And Okay, I will do the share to. screen thing. Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I guess I didn't say share screen properly yet. <laughs> Somehow it just went into this different view. Okay, here we go. Share screen, share, and go. program mode. There we go. Okay, you can see everything? Yes. All right, great. So um, as you heard in the introduction, I'm talking about um, weed management and kind of specifically about weed management for restoration. And we're gonna look at the question, what is vegetation and weed management planning anyway? So hopefully by the end of the evening, you won't be scratching your head about this question like this monkey is. And of course, weed management planning starts with a plan. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is I sent you some handouts. And so we'll just take a, a brief look at what those handouts contain, and then I'm going to go through how you use these formats and, and um, how they're going to help you make a plan. So if you have those handouts handy, you can have a look at them. 
the first part of it is just a general description of what integrated weed management planning is. And that is useful for you to read over as a general description. Um, we also have an integrated weed management plan checklist that looks something like what's here on my screen, although I took all the bullets out just to make it fit. Um, and we'll go over each of these check boxes and talk a little bit more specifically about what kinds of things you're gonna be thinking about when you're trying to manage your weeds. And so that's coming up. And then we're gonna go through the templates so we have template A, B, and C, and I wanna start with template A. And as we go through the program, I'm gonna explain and give more examples about where these things all fit in with making a weed management plan. So if you look at template A, it has these blanks and remember that this is just a template. So if you're actually doing this and putting all this information in a three ring binder or something to help you plan, um, you can expand this, you know, some of these instead of one line might end up being half a page, depending on how much you have to say about these different aspects of information that you're trying to get into your templates. So the date is important because um, if you have a property that you're managing, um, you're probably not doing everything at once. You might like to, but of course, that's not, not feasible. And so you might have part of your property that you're trying to restore and working on that you've started two years ago and you wanna kind of keep track of that template and how things are going on that part of your project. Um, and so it's good to kind of note the date when you first start thinking and planning about something so you can see your progress. Um, in any property, you're gonna have lots of locations or sites, specific sites within your property that are gonna have specific problems and may have to be managed differently from another site. So I think of these areas as kind of sub-sites within your property. And these could be something small like um, a garden, a driveway, an ornamental shrub bed, the corner of your yard behind your new garage that got messed up when you did construction that you now want to restore and put in native plants. So each of those is a sub-site of your property and each of them might require some different kinds of care and attention. And of course, in each of those sites, you're gonna have weeds and that's what this is all about. So you wanna make a list at each site of what weed species you have there, you know, the ones that you really are interested in controlling. Um, make a note of the approximate size of the area of concern and that's gonna come in handy when you're maybe buying seed in the future or if you decide to use a chemical, how much do you need? How much area are you covering? So it's good to have a real accurate idea of how big of a site you're talking about. Um, even if it's just your driveway, you know, how many square feet is your driveway? I was pretty shocked to find out when we painted our porch that I had the same square footage on my porch that I used to have in my whole house before I, I bought my new property. And when you go to buy paint, you know, it's good to know whether you've got 200 square feet of porch or 800 square feet of porch. Can be pretty shocking how much porch some people think they need <laughs> and have to paint. So anyway, the size is really important, um, not only for ordering materials and things appropriately, but also you know, to give yourself a realistic check on how much of this you can do by hand. You know, If it's a big piece or a little piece, it's gonna come into your considerations. Um, and then another thing that's I think sometimes hard for people to define is what is your actual goal for these different subsites in your, in your property? Um, do you want a weed fee free vegetable garden uh, or don't you care too much about the weeds in your garden? Maybe what you're really focused on is a healthy turf area for your kids and your dogs to play. Um, you wanna keep your driveway in good shape because it's very expensive to do driveway repairs and, and weeds can kind of undermine the integrity of your roadway. So there's a lot of different goals you have on these different sites and it's good to have that goal clearly in mind when it comes to managing weeds, because you don't wanna do something in the course of managing your weeds that interferes you know, in the long run with your goals and then have to go back and redo things or you know, make, make big changes. Um, it's good if you like to have, take photographs to take photographs before and after of your projects. I'm sure when Betsy and Mel talked to you, they probably um, mentioned something similar. It's, it's nice to see your your progress and also it helps when you're trying to monitor things to see if what you're doing is actually working. So photos and some kind of documentation 
would be good to attach to this first template. Then template B is where you're gonna really get down to the nitty gritty on which species of weeds you actually have. And this would be something you would fill out for each site. And I just wanna mention like until pe before people feel like, oh my God, she is a real weed nerd. A lot of these kind of templates and management things are, are designed kind of on for a big scale, like think Nature Conservancy or the land trust, people that are managing big properties. And you might have multiple three ring binders containing all this information for all of these sites. And whether you actually do this on paper and stick it in a folder, or you just kind of read through it and think about it in your head, um, whatever works for you, but actually thinking about it, putting it down on paper really helps you get some of the information you need collected in one place. And especially with this template B, um, I really urge people to find out as much as they can about the weed species they're dealing with because it really can make a difference on how you control it if you know more about your, your plants. And so you would, for each site within your property, complete this template B, um, where you're gonna list the scientific name of the plants and the common name. And the reason I say to do both is often if you're looking for information on the internet, which a lot of people do nowadays, um, you can get kind of higher quality information, I think, if you use the scientific name, and then you're more likely to get correct information um, because a lot of things have similar common names and you might be getting the wrong information if you're looking under the common name. And then you wanna prioritize those weeds with high, medium, or low. And we'll talk a little bit about this priority more later, but just keep in mind that there are different ways of prioritizing things, you know, by the severity of the weed um, and its potential damage to your property. For example, could be one way to prioritize things high, medium, and low, or the amount of work it's going to take, like something that's going to take a lot of work might be a high priority for you because you want to get going on it. For somebody else, it might make it a lower priority because you feel like, oh, we already have so much of that weed, let's concentrate on some of the stuff that we can actually get. So depending on how you're gonna control your weeds, you might be prioritizing them differently than, than your neighbor. I would recommend though, if it's a noxious weed, that those are always high priorities because those are the ones you really have to get rid of. Um, life cycle details, this kind of covers a whole bunch of things, as much of the information as you can find about the plant species that you're, you're working with. Um, you want to put that under life cycle details. So this is where you might make a note to go out and see your one page description of the weed where you're putting all this information that you're finding on the internet about your weed. And then list the effective control methods. Now these might not necessarily be the methods you're going to use, but look around and try to see as much information as you can find about what actually works to control this weed that you're working with. Because you might end up seeing that, say you've got five weeds and you've got several different control methods for each one, and there might be one method that stands out across all five weeds. It's like, oh, well, actually I could, you know, kill all these birds with one stone if I mowed or something like that. So it's good to show all of the effective methods, um, and then you're going to whittle it down and pick the methods you're actually going to use. Okay, so just before we get to template C, I wanna show you some of the example, some examples of some of the kinds of information you're looking for to fill out that template B, especially in the life cycle, life cycle section. The minimum you wanna put in the life cycle is whether it's an annual, a perennial, or a biennial, okay? And, and that's like, if you know nothing else about the weed besides its name, you have to know its basic life cycle because that really, plays an important part when you're trying to control the weed. So for example, here's kochia. It is a noxious weed. Annual plant, long taproot, hairy leaves, um, can grow up to six feet tall. So this is a big monster if you let it go. Tolerates dry, infertile soils. Now, where might you be putting a restoration planting? Someplace where the soil is dry, you can't get any irrigation up there, so you wanna plant natives, right? Well, there are a lot of weeds that love exactly that kind of situation too. This one happens to produce a ton of seed. So you know that's gonna be one of the focuses for your control, right, is to prevent the seeds. Um, the seeds are also 75% viable. So 75% of 14,000, that's a heck of a lot of seeds. The Achilles heel though, the weakness of this plant is the seed longevity is fairly short, one to two years, the seed bank. 
So that means if you could do three years of good control, you'd be done with this one. Um, it only reproduces by seeds. Sometimes under good conditions, the stem can re-sprout and produce more seeds after you mow. And this is something you really want to look into for each weed species if you are doing mechanical, especially mowing, is what is its potential for re-sprouting? Because mowing can be a ton of work and if you turn around three weeks later and see that everything you just mowed is sprouting again, it can be pretty disappointing. <laughs> so you wanna know before you mow whether they're gonna re-sprout. Um, germination, it's good to know when they come up and also do they have kind of um, a long-term germination potential. So kochia, for example, can be coming up anywhere from 36 degrees to 100 degrees outside. Um, it can germinate. So that means you, from early spring all through the summer, you can get new flushes of growth from um, new seedlings germinating. And it also disperses its seeds by tumbling. So that is a, an important piece of information. You want to prevent this from breaking off and getting off your property. So you take all that information that you've learned about the plant you're trying to control, and you're going to think about that and try to get to a really good control method based on the information you now know. So of course, you know you need to kill the plants when they're young to prevent seed production because the seed production is the only way this thing is gonna carry on. It's an annual plant. It's gonna die at the end of the year. Problem solved, right? Unless you've got 14,000 seeds waiting. And then also um, you could use mechanical controls such as tilling or pulling the plants by hand or repeated mowing. All of those techniques would reduce your seed production and also prevent tumbling. If you mow it down, the plant is still on your property, but at least it's not gonna blow around and scatter the seeds into new locations. Um, it's good to figure out if there's a biocontrol available. And for this particular one, there's not. We do have some effective biocontrols and we'll talk about that later. Not always probably the first thing you should think of, especially if you're doing a smaller size project, you're probably gonna to wanna to use a different method. Um, if you're thinking of herbicides, know what timing, uh, timing is really important and how big the plants should be when you start to spray, whether you need to use a surfactant, things like that. Um, with this particular plant, it's very hairy. And once it gets beyond about a foot or so tall, it gets to be, um, more resistant to herbicides. And some of them actually have herbicide resistant, genetically resistant strains developing to certain herbicides. So that's a real important thing. And when we get to talking about monitoring your results, um, that's especially important when you use herbicides. Um, you can try to use some cultural controls on this one by planting competitive plants. You might have to add irrigation um, and use natives on dry sites because that's the kind of place that it likes to grow. Okay, so that is, you know, just in a nutshell, what you would be doing for all five or six or seven, how many, how many weed species you have to control. You want to get some information like this um, that you can use when you're making your plan. Then template C is where you kind of put it all together. And for template C, we're talking about one species in one site. So this is the actual way that you're going to get rid of that plant. So you put down which species you're controlling and some of the important points from the life cycle information that you found that are kind of those weak spots for that plant. Like with the kochia, preventing the seed production will get rid of it in two or three years as long as you don't get new seeds coming in. Um, the, the timing then, once you've gathered all that information, it's really important to nail down when do I do it to, to get the best control on this particular plant. And then here's where you're gonna really nail down the method that you're gonna use. You've looked at all these things, mechanical, cultural, chemical, um, maybe three out of four of them are pretty effective, but what are you actually gonna do? And that's where you would figure that out. You might have to use two methods. You know, you might wanna pull out the big plants that have already gotten away from you. That would be mechanical. Um, you wanna spray the remaining thick patches of seedlings because it'd be too hard to pull them all out one by one. And then maybe in that bare, spot, you're going to put some compost and reseed um, in, a, in an area that you can put a little bit of temporary irrigation. So all of those things together, you're using three or four different methods of weed control to control one plant in one place. And this is, is kind of your best way um, to get weed control is by coming at it from all these different angles. 
And then how do you um, whoops, plan to monitor your weed species? Now, you know, on a small site in your backyard, it, this kind of seems like a no brainer. Well, I'm just gonna look out the window and see if I did a good job, right? Um, but when you think about the life cycle of your plant, especially with an annual, at the end of the year, an annual weed, they're all dead. It looks great. You did a good job. They're all gone. But what's really going to matter is the before and after picture when you take a picture in the spring. And last year in the spring, the hillside was covered with little kochia seedlings. And this year, you only see a few patches. That's when you know you did a good job. So being able to, to um, compare before and after and using a good um, life stage of the plant to compare. If you're looking at a perennial plant, you know, the number of stems in the population um, maybe is gonna be a good, a good um, monitoring factor. And then how do you know your weed plan is effective? Kind of similar to monitoring, well, you're gonna look and see if it looks better, right? Um, but you might wanna compare your monitoring information over several seasons because Say you have something with a longer seed bank than kochia, you're going to want to know for several seasons in a row, you know, am I getting fewer and fewer plants? If so, then my plan is effective. If not, should I keep doing the same thing? No, you have to do something different. Maybe you need to change the timing. Maybe you need to change the chemical. Maybe you have to mow shorter or taller. So monitor and then evaluate so you know if what you do is working because it's all a lot of work and you don't want to keep doing something if it's not effective. Okay, so that's the first three templates. And then we also have that integrated weed management plan checklist. So we're going to look a little bit closer at some of those bullet points and talk about that. A lot of it is kind of, you know, self-explanatory. So the first thing is to define your goals. So we talked about that with the template A. So as you do this, your property, then some of the information you gather here will feed into those templates A, B, and C. So you're going to um, define your goals, but some points to remember when you set goals is you have short-term <clears throat> short goals and long-term goals. And then also, when are you actually going to begin your restoration project? Because maybe it's not something you can get to for another three years. So in the meantime, your short-term goal may be, okay, that big weedy place, I'm just going to keep mowing it for three years. Then we're going to build a garage. It's like going to get all disturbed. Then we're going to start our long-term plan, which is to do the restoration. And that's going to take us five or six years. Okay. So have a realistic idea of what the goal is and how long you want it to take. Um, this is a really good point is describe your property to be managed. Now, I would bet that I wasn't able to sit in on, on Betsy or, or Mel's talks but I'm sure that they both mentioned this, is really have a good understanding of your property so you know what you're dealing with. Location of the subsites within your property, but also your property, how it's located in, in your neighborhood and in the area in general. You know, Are you on the north slope of a long ridge or are you perched up facing south on a little hill? You know, That makes a difference in the location, as well as the specific site within your yard you know, is it getting shade from the house or is it on an exposed slope? And that slope and aspect are really important because it's not, you, you know, those are things you have to work around. You can't change it. As much as you want to plant a shady music native plant garden, if you only have a south aspect to work with, it's, it's just not going to be successful. It'll be frustrating. Um, then your site information, this is just real good to have, you know, for your, your property in general. Um, a lot of this kind of stuff is, is uh, something you probably know already, but for example, soil type, and I, I didn't put anything in my resources, and I, every time I give this talk, I think I should look this up, and then I forget after I'm done. But, you know, there are some interesting sites out there that are um, for soil typing, so you can look up your property on a map, and you can find out exactly what the name of your soil type is in your area. And then knowing that, you can plug that soil type into some other resources and find out things that that soil is capable of. And some of this stuff is really interesting. Like I remember working for the BLM, looking up some soil types when we were doing some rare plant surveys. And one of the characteristics of one of the soil types is this is not a soil type you can bury large dead animals in. 
that, well, who knew? I mean, I didn't even know that they categorized soils with that kind of information. And, you know, whether, you know, whether it would be successful to irrigate it or things like that. So soil type is, is important too. Um, and then also, you know, if you're planting native plants, part of the reason we do it is because they're well adapted to this area. But some plants are really more specifically adapted to certain soil types than other soil types. And so knowing that is going to be helpful. And then irrigation type, um, you know, that's a little bit more than just, yes, I have irrigation water. No, I don't. Um, there are some things you could do to, you know, set up like a temporary irrigation system. For example, if you're putting in plugs and using forbs, um, you might be able to temporarily irrigate them. And the difference of irrigating and not irrigating could mean the success or failure of your planting. And so think hard about irrigation, you know, before you think it's impossible, just think about, well, what if I went up there with a watering can and a bucket like once at least after, you know, there's some ways that you might be able to work irrigation into your, um, into your plan. And then think about your other things here. I say ornamentals, but it could be anything um, that's associated with your weeds. If you're putting in native plants and you already have some native plants on your site that you wanna protect, think about those when you're looking at how you're gonna get rid of the weeds. Um, and also think about animals that are associated with your land. Like my place, we have giant Palouse earthworms and sharp-tailed snakes, which are both two rare species that happen to both occur on my property, which was really a surprising thing to find out. Um, as long, and also that we have um, a rare Lomatium species. So this cluster of three unusual and rare things are up in this corner where I want to do my restoration. So of course, I'm gonna take that in consideration when I plan how to do weed control. Also be very aware of water systems in and around your property. So not just like, I don't have a stream on my property, I don't have to worry about it. But if water runs off of your property, where does it go? Does it go onto your neighbor's property? Does it go into a stream? You know, so be aware of that because um, not just with chemicals, but also, you know, soil disturbance. Are you gonna be causing erosion where does the water go when there's water? So you might not have water right now, but if you have a big rainstorm and something happens, um, it's always good to be aware of water movement on your property. Okay, and then weed identification. This is a really important one, and I always emphasize this whenever I'm giving a talk, you have to know what you're dealing with. So know the weed species you have on your property, figure out their scientific names, um, and figure out what areas are infested with which weeds and how many you have. And also if there's any way of finding out the method of introduction, is this something that's literally blowing in the air and coming to your property? Is it something that comes in stuck on the tires of your car? Is your dog bringing it in? You know, as, as much as you can find out about the specific weeds you have and how they get around, that's always useful information. And then as we talked about before, when you're looking at prioritizing your weeds, you have to think of kind of a risk management mind frame. So the noxious or not noxious is one way of ranking um, how invasive they are once they're in your property. Um, I mean, there are many weeds that are not on the noxious list that are also highly invasive. Um, do they have something specific that makes them more damaging or risky to your property? Like, are they allelopathic? Are they literally poisoning the soil so that other things can't grow there? So you can think about these different levels of risk ranking for the weeds when you have so many and you gotta prioritize it somehow. Um, and then look at other weeds in and around your areas where you plan to do restorations or improvements in your property. See where those sites are for seed recruitment um, how are they going to get back into your hard-won ground once you clear out the weeds you have? Okay, and then weed management priorities. Um, again, prioritization is important when you have lots of things to deal with. Um, look for the ways of preventing potential invasions. Um, and think about whether you're going to be doing intensive management, like up to and including eradication for some of your high-priority weeds. Or are you gonna be sort of managing long-term established stands of weeds that are kind of no hope of getting rid of those might be a lower priority to start with, um, especially if they're not directly involved in your restoration project. But just remember, 
if you're managing a stand of weeds, it always um, leaves you open to the potential of them to be moving into areas where you've already controlled weeds. Okay, then later on, I'm gonna go through all of these different strategies more specifically. So for now, just let's say there are many strategies that you can use, prevention, mechanical, biological, chemical, cultural, and then ultimately revegetation. When you get rid of weeds, you need to put something in their place to prevent more weeds from coming back. And like we mentioned with template um, C, part of that plan you're making is to monitor and evaluate the efficacy. Um, because efficacy means, right, is it effective? Is it working? And you wanna be using a strategy that works and you want to adjust it if it's not working. That makes sense. Okay. So questions so far, we are about half an hour into this. So if there's no questions, I'll just keep going. And actually I haven't been monitoring the chat box. Does anybody see any questions so far? Not, not yet, uh, but yeah, let's give everybody a minute or so. If you have any questions put in the chat box. Um, that would be and I'm, I have another break built in for questions later and then oh, also okay. at the end. So if you want to think about things and save them up, that's fine too. Okay, so where I want to go now. So we talked about these templates and how they can help you with making the plan. But once you've decided, okay, I'm controlling this weed, I have to know which way I'm actually going to, to do that. And so we're going to talk about these different methods and what's available. Um, and also just a quick mention of the word control because we use the word control a lot and it actually has kind of a legal meaning in the noxious weed law and it means to prevent all seed production. And more specifically, if you read the, the noxious weed law, it says to uh, prevent the production of seed and propagules within and from your property. So that means you gotta keep your own weeds at your own house. <laughs> But you also have to be preventing them from reproducing uncontrolled on your property. And that's, that's the definition of control. So it doesn't mean you've actually gotten rid of all the plants, um, unless we're talking about eradication. In that case, you know, you're actually getting rid of all the plants and their propagules. Okay, so there's a little bit of a different definition for control. And I also like to mention um, that there's different kinds of weeds, obviously. We do have a noxious weed law. So the noxious weeds that I'm usually dealing with, people call me and ask me about, are things like white top, diffuse knapweed, Russian knapweed, punk turbine, kochia. These are really the big five around here. And I get a lot of calls about these. These are on the noxious weed list. People are supposed to be controlling them. And we ask people to send in control plans every year showing their progress, because clearly some of these, especially the perennial ones, are not just a one shot and you're done. It takes people three or four years, sometimes even longer um, to get noxious weeds under control. Um, nuisance weeds, these are weeds that are not on the noxious weed list, but are also very common. Tumble mustard, prickly lettuce, horseweed, salsify, uh, common mallow, you know these, most of them can all be growing in the same square yard. You know, you just scratch the soil and make a disturbance anywhere in the county and at least four out of five of these weeds will probably come up. These are really common and we consider them nuisance weeds because they're not on the list. But if they're your priority on your property to get rid of, you know, they can be high priority weeds too. Okay, so we'll just get this one out of the way first because this is the one that people, their back goes up a little bit when we talk about chemical control. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I think there's a lot of information out there that's a little bit kind of overblown and um, people kind of get afraid of things that they don't totally understand. But in some cases, um, herbicide control uh, is like a stitch in time. If you can use it effectively, you can kind of nip a problem in the bud and not let it get really big. Um, the main thing, the number one point about herbicide control is you have to read and follow the manufacturer's label and instructions. So when you buy a chemical, an herbicide, whether you buy it at Lowe's or you go down to Wilbur Ellis, wherever you get it, you buy it online, you're obligated to read the label and follow it. So anything that you do with that chemical that's not 
on the label is an off-label use and that is illegal. So you're taking on a responsibility when you decide to use herbicides um, and the extent of your responsibility is right there on the label. You can see what you can and cannot do with the herbicide. So it's always the first step is read the label. You might wanna read the label before you buy the herbicide because you might just decide, well, this one's a little bit more risky than I want to deal with, or this one isn't really gonna control the weeds I have in mind anyway. So it'd be a waste of money. Um, so read the label first, buy the chemical, and then read the label again. And if you're going to use it again next year, read the label again. It, it never hurts to make sure you really know the label well. Um, some herbicides, you need a license to apply. Uh, if you go into Lowe's or Home Depot, anything they have on the shelf, you can buy and use without a license. Um, the things that, are, that require a license are restricted use herbicides, and those are gonna be the kind of things you might have to go to Northwest Wholesale or Chamberlain or Wilbur Ellis to pick those up. Um, so if you buy it at the hardware store, you don't need a license. The ones that require a license are generally the ones that have a little higher um, risk. And so instead of just a caution label, the label might say danger. Um, there's industry standard cautions that are on the labels. Um, so the higher, risk ones are usually when you require a pesticide license to use. You can get two different kinds of chemicals. You can get those that are selective and they only kill certain kinds of plants or you can get herbicides that kill all plants. And so the, the type that kill all plants, the non-selective you're very familiar with is the typical Roundup, um, things like that. A lot of the products that you use on lawns contain 2,4-D for example, and that's a selective broadleaf weed killer. So it kills the broadleaf weeds in your lawn, but it doesn't kill your lawn. There's a very few chemicals that work the other way. They kill grasses, but not broadleaves. And that's kind of the holy grail for <laughs> landscapers and people who manage like ornamental beds and plantings, because if you have an ornamental, say you have a nice five foot wide perennial border and it starts getting grass in it, it's really, really hard to control grass amongst established broadleaf plants. And so that's kind of the holy grail, the herbicide industry is to find something that kills grass, but not broad leaves. Keep the chemicals we have that already control broad leaves, but not grass, because we don't want to lose those because of, you know, labeling mishaps and things. Um, so the selectivity is really valuable in an herbicide. Um, Herbicide use also has carries the greatest liability because it's more likely than most of the other methods that you might make a mistake that causes damage to somebody else's property. So for example, if, you're, if your method of control is hand pulling, it's unlikely that you're gonna hand pull so vigorously that you end up on your neighbor's property pulling plants out and then your next neighbor and your next neighbor, you know, you're just, that's, it's kind of a self-limiting activity. You're not gonna overhand pull. You can overspray, you can cause drift, you can cause runoff from your property when you're using chemicals. So there are ways of you know, causing off property collateral damage when you're using chemicals that are not usually a problem with most of the other methods that you could choose. So, but all that being said, sometimes it's just, the right thing in the right place that could really make a difference in success or failure in your weed control. Um, biological control, I'm just gonna touch lightly on this because for the most part, it isn't really that effective on weed control for restoration type projects because it takes a long time to work and it's only available for a very few weeds and it's very specific. So you can control one bug controls knapweed, one bug controls Dalmatian toad flax or purple loose stripe. It's not a kind of a broad spectrum thing. Um, and not all of the bugs that are approved for biological control are even you know, very um, convenient to get a hold of. So this is um, one of the tools out there, but it's not often used for restoration. This would be more like if you've got 20 acres and it's kind of got some native plants, but it also has knapweed. You'd want to get some bugs and release it out there, especially if it's a place that's hard to access or something. So it can be a useful tool, but often not in your smaller scale kind of restoration plantings. Here's just some before and after. It is impressive when it works. And this is the kind of setting where biological control 
is a perfect solution out in the wild lands, steep slopes, hard to access. How would you get rid of all those toad flax plants? You let the bugs out in 2012. And by um, 2016, I guess that other picture is, my gallery keeps getting in the way of my screen here, but that's pretty impressive before and after. I, you know, this is one of those times when the, the phrase, my jaw dropped, literally happened when I saw this picture. The after picture was just pretty shocking. Here's another one. This, um, the weed in the picture here is diffuse knapweed, all of that fuzzy looking green weed. And there's some yarrow in there that's blooming. And the after picture is a little bit post bloom um, four years later. So the yarrow is still in there. It's just not so bright white and dazzling. But you'll also notice that there's some other plants in there and there's some lupin. Um, and the knapweed is pretty much gone. So the bugs have been at work in the site about four years later, you can see this kind of result. So in certain areas, you know, it's, it's, the good, it's a good thing to use, but it's not always applicable for restoration. Mechanical control, this is the one, um, the one type of control that has the most options within it. Um, hand pulling, tilling, mowing, tarping, solarizing, mulching. There's all kinds of things you can do to mechanically suppress weeds. Um, and this is also the, the type of control that it's really important to understand your weed because you can mow and put all the effort into mowing, but if you do it at the wrong time, it could be totally ineffective. And so you really have to understand the timing and, and what these things do. And, you know, and, and think about the safety too. People get pretty wound up about chemical control, but with mechanical control, you know, there's some dangerous things you can do with mechanized equipment too, especially when you mix um, steep slopes and unstable soils with um, motorized machinery. So it's um, something to keep in mind when you're deciding on this. And of course, not all mechanical control is mechanized. There's good old fashioned hand pulling and weed whacking um, as well are included under mechanical. Cultural control, this is one I get a lot of questions about because people don't get it. And then me putting the goat in there didn't help. Um, <laughs> because cultural control isn't necessarily just grazing, but some people use grazing as a type of cultural control, especially if you're using an animal that sort of selectively chooses the weeds instead of the desirable plants. Or sometimes it can be a good method to kind of get a lot of weeds out of the way before you start, and then um, use some of your other control methods once things are kind of knocked back by the grazers. Um, anything can be considered cultural control if it is something that you do to favor your desirable plants instead of the weeds. So you're trying to target something that improves the plants that you already have there so they become better competitors to the weeds. So something like um, improving the timing of your fertilizer applications or uh, irrigation or rotating crops here doesn't really apply that much to restoration. But for example, say you have a vacant area and you're not quite ready to restore it yet and it has a big weed problem. Well, if you tilled it over and put in a legume crop one year and that would really improve your nitrogen, um, uh, the nitrogen in your soil, the next year you could plant something that's really fast growing and competitive like a mustard crop. It'll really thrive in that high nitrogen soil and it'll smother out the weeds. And so by rotating back and forth with crops like that, you could keep that area pretty weed free. So by the time you come in to do some restoration, your weed problems would be much less than if you had just let the, the land sit there vacant and accumulating weeds. So that would be one way that rotating crops would apply to um, a restoration type of planting. And then prevention, prevention, prevention is worth an ounce of cure, a pound of cure, what is it? Um, try to eliminate populations before they get established, which is kind of impossible, but I mean, eliminate it when it's really small, like the very first time. Um, I, I had an example of this when we bought our new house, and I keep calling it my new house, but it's like eight years ago now. Um, I saw one tiny patch, it might have literally been two or three plants of a plant that's called catchweed or madweed, it's very prickly, it sticks to your pants, it forms these huge viney mounds when it gets out of control. 
And I literally jumped on it. I mean, I jumped on it with both feet and I pulled it out. I put a little chemical there, some uh, pre-emergent and I watched that spot like a hawk because I really did not want it. And it was the only place I ever saw it and I eliminated it. You know, the first year gone, no weed problem. Had I ignored it, it would have crawled all up the bank and it would have been a mess. Um, so you're not usually eliminating things before they really get started. But there's some precautionary methods you can take. And this is, you know, the typical prevention things is be aware of the undersides of your vehicles, trailers, things you bring into your property. Um, if you get rental equipment like soil moving equipment or soil drills or anything that you borrow or rent from someplace else, um, it might come in with dirt on it, soil clinging to it. And if it does, it could likely have some weeds on it that you don't have yet. And the idea there is you might park it in one spot and rinse it off with a hose. And then at least you know where those weed seeds are. They're right in the middle of the driveway where you washed it with a hose. Then you can keep an eye on that area. And if anything comes up, just, just hit it right away. If you bring in materials like gravel or topsoil, that can be a little more complicated because these things you spread out usually. So keep an eye on any gravel or, or topsoil that you spread for new things popping out of it that you might not have. Um, watch your shoes and pants cuffs um, and your pets because you can bring a lot of stuff into your property this way. If you're like me and you sit on the back porch and pick all the seeds out of your socks after you hike, um, just beware of that back porch area because you could have things sprouting up there. And I have to tell you, literally one time, my socks were so full of seeds. I thought, this is really interesting. I'm gonna pick every seed, uh, interesting to me. I mean, you might be like, oh, um, but I picked every seed out of my socks and I put them in a dish and I looked at them under a microscope. And the seeds in my socks alone represented eight different families of plants. And I had 15 different species represented in the seeds collected on my socks. Now I couldn't identify them all from seed. I know that some of them were weedy species. Some of them might've been native plants. Um, but I think at least half of them were weed species. So it, interesting how much, and I think I had over 120 in my, in my two socks. So it's a real thing. You can bring stuff onto your property that way. So learn to identify anything new that's popping up. It's really good to, you know, take a walk around your property, keep your eyes open. If something's new, it is less likely. I mean, I don't want to be Debbie Downer. But if it's something new that pops up, it's less likely that it's like a volunteer dahlia. It's most likely some kind of a weedy species. So keep an eye on those newcomers and um, don't be like me and say, let's how, see how big this mullen plant could grow here in the irrigated garden and then have mullen seeds all over the yard for the next five years. Um, some of those experiments are just not worth it. So you want to prevent bigger problems. And I put this slide in here with the guy being overwhelmed by the dandelion just to remind me to talk about, you know, weed control is simple, but not easy. There's only so many ways you can kill a plant, right? You can dig it out, you can mow it down, you can put some chemical on it. But the big question comes in when you think about how many plants do I have? How much area are they spread over? And what kind of characteristics do those plants have that are thwarting me from controlling them? So one-on-one, -on -one, me on a plant, it's pretty easy. Um, simple and easy. But when you have a bigger problem and you have more property, more different weeds, that's when it gets complicated. And that's what these templates and lists do. They help you kind of see the whole picture and get a hold of it. So what I want to do now is just to show um, let me check my time here. Um, hey, Julie, we have of, a question too, if you have a... Okay, this would be a good time to stop for a question. Okay, so somebody was asking, Amy was asking uh, uh, if you know insects that would prey on, that prey on horsetails, foley or, or rhizomes. No, I don't know of one like, like an actual biocontrol agent. And horsetails is one of those horrible weeds where all of the weed experts will just shake their head and say, sorry, that's a really tough one. And, and it is because even if you use chemicals, no label says anything more than suppress. 
this chemical will suppress horsetails. Um, if we're talking about equisetum, because mare's tail is another story in the, in the sunflower family, equisetum is an ancient lineage of old uh, plants from the Carboniferous period. Um, and they're also called scouring rush. And they're really, really hard to control because they're perennial. They have a massive rhizome system and uh, they're very resistant to soaking up chemicals. And so the, the, the main chemical approach to them is to try to um, inhibit the root formation because they have all these rhizomes, but then they also have these little feeder roots. And so some of the things like casserole or preen that you put on in your ornamental beds and stuff, um, they kind of suppress those little feeder roots from developing. And so it kind of knocks it back a little bit, but really, and even if you, if you go to a, a weed conference and all the chemical guys are there and they, of course, always, everything works great, right? But if you nail them down on horse tail, they all admit, sorry, there's just really nothing. It's just a matter of pulling it and pulling it and pulling it and suppressing it by um, preventing it from having green photosynthetic tissue above the ground, which means basically you keep pulling it all summer, every summer. So, sorry. <laughs> It's not one of our poster childs for <laughs> effective weed control. Okay, so now we're gonna look at an actual weed management plan sort of in, in progress um, in a small way because it's kind of a big, big story here. So we're gonna look at this property and up in this corner is a restoration project area. And you can see the property boundaries in pink and there's a house and a garage and some driveways and some various other things. Um, there's an orchard up in the upper left-hand corner. There's a vegetable garden. Um, there's a lower area where you can see those big green spots. Hmm, some irrigation problems there. And we are gonna do a restoration project, but we also wanna look at the whole property and say, are there any other weed issues here that could be causing problems? Wow, there are lots of weed issues. Okay, so we're gonna cover some of these, but not all in detail. So we do need a plan, we have lots of problems. And so how do we proceed? We're gonna look at the whole picture because our restoration area, which we're gonna be putting a lot of time and potentially money into maybe restoring with native plants, is gonna be vulnerable to weed invasions from the rest of the property as well. So we're gonna to wanna to control weeds in the restoration area, but we want to also get a handle on some of our other problems we're going to combine as many of our integrated weed management practices as we can to make it effect, effective and efficient. So you might want to think about making a plan for your whole property, maybe not all at once, but to be aware of what's going on. So the restoration area itself has these issues. It has some native plants present. It has lots of weedy, weedy annual grasses. It's on a very steep slope and it has no irrigation. Hmm, sounds like a picnic but we're gonna make a stab at it. So what we would do is we would take our template A, very specifically for that restoration site right now, we're not gonna worry about the other weed areas yet, and we're gonna fill this out. So the kind of information I would put in here, I'm picking um, five or let's see, four or five different weed species. Um, I describe my location as the Northeast Restoration Corner. I have cereal rye, bulbous bluegrass, diffuse snapweed, and Dalmatian toad flax. Um, approximate size, a little over a tenth of an acre. And my management goal is to convert the area to native grass and forbs over the next four years, 80% conversion. I'm not a perfectionist, okay? There might be some things in there that aren't native. And then I wanna do photos and sketches to um, monitor my progress, okay? So that's template A. Template B, I'm gonna list all of my weed species, um, get the scientific names, Think of the priority that I have. And then here I'm going to like go out to another sheet of paper and list all of the information I have about cereal rye, similar to the way we described kosha earlier. And I'm going to look at my effective control methods, not necessarily the one I'm going to choose yet, but I just want to know how many different methods do I have that could be effective for all these plants. And then when I get all that done for this particular area, 
I'm going to look at each particular wheat. So for this example, I just picked cereal rye. Okay, so I've already looked it up on the internet. I've got all this information about cereal rye, and I know about its life cycle, and I know its Achilles heel. I know its weak point, and that is that it has a very short seed bank. Like kosha, it's only one, two, three years, maybe at the most. So I'm going to put in here the information that I found looking around about when is the best timing for controlling this weed. And of course, the timing depends on which method you're using. So if I'm going to mow, for example, I want to mow just prior to pollen release. So that means I'm going to have to be monitoring those plants, looking at them, what state are they in. And as soon as I see one with an anther hanging out, I know that pollination is imminent and I wanna get my mowing done before it starts shedding pollen for two reasons. One is it has already put a lot of energy into creating the flowers and the pollen is ready to emerge. The other reason is if I wait until the pollen's already coming out, it's a very nasty thing to mow through a patch of grass with its pollen flying. You have to wear a mask, it's bad for your sinuses. If you have allergies, it's a nightmare. So for both of those reasons, you want to get it before the pollen is shedding, but not too far before. You want to wait until it's put as much reserves into the seed heads as possible. That'll prevent, not really prevent, but it'll suppress the production of another seed head, but more on that later. Um, if I'm going to use chemical, on the other hand, I want to wait until the plant has maybe six to eight inches of new growth, and then I'm going to use my chemical. So I'm gonna decide now, which of these methods do I wanna use, okay? Let's say I'm gonna be on vacation off and on and I don't have time to be monitoring for that pollen release. I might choose to wait until the plants are six to eight inches tall and then go spray them. But I don't wanna do any collateral damage on my native plants that are already there. So I'm deciding I'm gonna mow with a string trimmer. And based on experience, I know I might have to mow two or three times because after I mow the first time, the plants can have a second flush of growth, put up another flowering stem and try to flower again. And so um, this could be two or three times of mowing in one season, okay? And I'm doing this to, because I'm trying to prioritize the prevention of collateral damage on my native plants, okay? If I didn't have as many native plants out there, maybe I would go with the chemical option. But okay, you choose your method of control. And again, you, you might be using multiple different things, like maybe on the outer edges of this, where the pressure for the um, cereal rye is really high, it gets a little overshoot from some irrigation. Maybe on those dense patches, I'm just gonna spray them and not worry about it. So you could use multiple methods here. And then um, how am I gonna monitor? Well, based on some of the things I know about my plants, I'm choosing to monitor with photo points because cereal rye happens to have a pretty distinctive color. It's kind of a blue green. Um, when you see a mass of it on a hill, it's, it's very distinctive looking. So based on maybe a photo point taken at the same time of year for a couple of years in a row, I could really visually see the population decreasing because I can pick it out based on the color. And you know, depending on what weed you're controlling, you might monitor at a different time of year or you might choose to do something like counting plants in an area. Um, but I'm choosing to do a photo point. And then how will I know my plan is effective? Well, because it's an annual and what I'm really trying to do is prevent seeds, I'm gonna be effective if I'm preventing new plants from germinating the following year, right? Because all my plants are gonna die at the end of the year anyway, whether I do anything or not. But what I'm really looking at is, am I preventing seed production? And so to figure that out, I'm gonna monitor photos from one spring to the next spring at a similar time when the, um, plants have germinated. Okay, so that's my management plan for one weed on one site, okay? So I'm gonna repeat the process. I'm gonna use template A and B for each site, template C, where I wrap it all together for each weed in each site. And you, you wanna remember, and this is a definition from that first page of the handout, integrated weed management is species specific and it's tailored to exploit the weakness of a particular weed species. It's also site specific and designed to be practical and safe. Now, practical and safe need a little more explanation. Practical for who? Think about that in your case. For you, for a contractor, for your kids who owe you a big favor, 
Is this gonna be a practical method for somebody to do on your property? Um, and safe for who? You have to think about safety for yourself, whoever is doing this control. Think about safety for your soil and the native plants and animals in your area. So the, the safety issue is something that you have to look at the broad picture because you know, some people will jump on the bandwagon with this solarization idea, put this plastic on the ground, it cooks all the weed seeds and kills them. Well, if you're cooking a weed seed, you're also cooking nematodes, bacteria, all kinds of microorganisms that are important to your soil. So you might think that herbicides are the most unsafe thing you can use, but herbicides kill plants that are emerged. And they're pretty benign on most of the soil organisms, whereas something like solarization, which seems to be a sort of safe and natural alternative to chemicals can actually be pretty bad for your soil. So you have to kind of balance the safety issues you know, between all of the members of the community, yourself, your soil organisms, your native plants and animals and the weeds. And also think about these words, they're important, effective, efficient, affordable, and sustainable. So is it an effective method? Will it actually work? Is it an efficient method? You know, pulling annual grasses, pulling them out by the roots is very effective, but it's not very efficient because if you have annual grasses invading an area, even a small area, you can have thousands and thousands of small plants. So it's not gonna be efficient to pull them out by hand, even though it might be very effective to pull them out by hand. Also, is it affordable? This is something you should be thinking about from the very beginning. Um, you can have some pretty grand plans, but then you know, can you afford them? And, and if you can't, maybe you gotta change your plan and do something a little different. Maybe a little more elbow grease, maybe a little smaller restoration area, something. And then is it sustainable? Because a lot of people take on a project and we see this with vegetable gardening every year. Um, you're all enthused about it in the beginning, but then maybe mowing my hillside three times every summer for the next four years, maybe that's gonna get old. Maybe that's not sustainable. So if that's not, then I have to kind of go back to the drawing board and think of something that is more sustainable. So just keep those terms in mind too, when you're making a plan. And don't forget, we have lots of other problems to address. So if we did a plan for all of these other sites, it, you know, you'd have a really comprehensive plan. So steep slopes, constant disturbance, junk piles, um, little, you can see like little piles of stuff that are there. Um, junk piles harbor weeds, they're hard to control. Uh, you don't wanna reach your hand into a junk pile and pull weeds, there might be a snake in there or a black widow or something. So all of these kinds of problems need solutions. Stone and gravel piles, okay? Constant disturbance, you're going in there, scooping soil, putting it, spreading it around, you're disturbing. And the piles themselves, like we talked about in prevention, might be sources of weed introduction to the property. And they could also be harboring weeds that are hard to get to. And then they end up spreading around the property. And then snakes, again, you could have snakes in your rock piles, piles of bricks, anything you pile up on your property could be a shelter for snakes. And, and that's good and bad because if it's a snake like the sharp-tailed snake, which is rare and endangered and I want it on my property, um, and even rattlesnakes, I mean, they have their purpose and they're very beneficial, but you don't wanna stick your hand into a rock pile to pull a weed and get bit by a snake. So you have to consider what these, what these um, piles and junk and stuff on your property are doing and how to manage the weeds. And in many cases, you'd the easiest thing would be just to spray around those piles, but then what about the snakes or what about, you know, so you have to think about all those things. Um, orchard properties are things that have to be maintained in very specific ways for pests and weed control requirements. And we're not gonna get into that there because it's a real can of worms. <laughs> um, more piles, wood piles, think about your wood piles and any kind of material you're stockpiling for future projects. And equipment parking, every time your car goes in and out, if you move your trailers and things like that in and out of your property, potential, potential problems. Um, all of these sites need specific weed control plans. Um, even if that plan is just like, okay, we're gonna move all the vehicles and spray some Roundup and then park everything back. Or we're gonna mow it. We're gonna get out the weed whacker twice a year, move all that stuff and, and mow. So it could be a simple, simple plan like that. 
but it's something you need to think about. Driveways too, driveways have a lot of maintenance issues, especially if they're gravel, because I mean, if you tried to plant a tomato in the middle of your driveway, it would be hopeless. But other weeds love the packed hard soil of gravel driveways, but they can undermine the integrity of the road. They can bung up your um, snowblower in the winter when you get these big things like prostrate knotweed, you know, tangled up in the blades of your snowblower. So there's a lot of good reasons to control weeds in your driveways. Um, they're, they're a big problem. Um, this one I wanted to point out, <clears throat> if you look down here at the bottom of the property, where you see these green circles. From Google Earth, you can see all these amazing problems with people's properties. <laughs> so here, you know, there's all these weeds down by the fence line. Well, when you get a bird's eye view of it, the reason is the irrigation is bad down there. And so the grass isn't thick. And so all these weeds are coming up. And so this was a really simple problem is you just fix the irrigation so the overlap is better. And that's a cultural control method, right? I'm trying to improve the conditions for my grass and when I do that, it automatically gets rid of the weeds because the grass and the clover is really effective at choking out weeds. So sometimes a simple cultural control thing can solve your problem. Um, vegetable gardens and the neighbor's arborvitae fence. Always when you're doing any kind of control with weeds on your property, consider your borders and what other people have planted nearby. Arborvitaes are notoriously sensitive to chemicals. So I wouldn't want to get near them with, with anything, any kind of herbicide, um, especially because they're not my trees and I don't wanna ding my neighbor's trees. And then a vegetable garden, clearly you're trying to grow vegetables, which are plants and you don't really wanna get herbicides in there and, and uh, kill the plants you're working so hard to nurture. So here's a good place for mechanical control and some cultural controls to help you keep weeds under control there. Um, and the last little one here, uh, something to think about, we have bees, beehives on this property. And uh, it's not what you might think, like you're afraid to spray anything on the bees, but the bees get kind of ornery if you get close to them. So if you have to keep getting next to your beehives and pulling weeds or mowing with a weed whacker, the bees, the bees get upset. And when they get upset, they come and sting you. <laughs> so you wanna do something that's kind of a hands-off weed control. And here you might wanna do something like mulching, putting down a tarp and, and putting a heavy dose of mulch on top of it to prevent the weeds from coming up at all so you don't have to get in there near the bees. Okay, so that is kind of a whirlwind tour of multiple problems and how you might um, make a plan to manage all of those things. And while you're thinking, if you have any questions, I just wanna go, go through a couple of resources I have here. Um, Washington State University Extension website is uh, called HortSense is useful. Um, they have all kinds of fact sheets about fruits and vegetables, and they do have weed fact sheets, um, how to control some common weeds in your yard and garden. So that's, an, that's a useful site. Um, this University of California IPM website is great. They have a really good weed gallery. Um, you can look things up in the weed gallery, and they have lots of pictures of all the different parts of the plant. This is, and as well as some control information. And this would be like your template B where you get all that information about the plant would be at a site like this um, University of California website. Another good one is the, um, the Weed Science Society of America. This is a, a, a national society for weed control. They also have a really good um, weed gallery with lots of uh, tips for identification. I think they also have an interactive key. So if you don't know what weed you have, you can go in there and figure it out. They also maintain the list of common names that are accepted for weeds on herbicide labels. So when you look at um, that list, you can see, well, I call it cheese weed, but the real name is common mallow. And yeah, that's on this herbicide bottle. So that might work. So they, they maintain that sort of official list of common names. So that's handy. Um, the state noxious weed, uh, weed website is pretty good. They have real good fact sheets on all of the noxious weeds anyway, and lots of pictures for identifying um, the different weeds. And last but not least, there are always books. Weeds of the West is a good one for this area. There's also a two volume, um, I think it's just called California Weeds, which is really good. And of course it features a lot of weeds that are found in California that aren't found here, but a lot of the weeds we have are also found in California. So it's a good um, 
it's a good reference for Western weeds. And then our little weed booklet that we hand out everywhere. You've probably seen this around town. We put it at the plant store, the nurseries and, you know, chemical stores and things like that. So that's pretty common. So weed management planning summed up is basically gather your information, make a plan, execute your plan, monitor and repeat the previous steps as needed. Hopefully not for too many years. <laughs> okay, and if there's questions, I am happy to put up my contact information and answer questions. Yeah, so um, Julie, so thank you very much. And we do have a question here. So if you have a half acre of thistle mixed with ferns and you want to remove the thistle, would you try to keep the ferns to overtake the thistle? Or would you remove it all and be able to effectively remove the thistle seeds that are already in the soil? Hmm. So if you have a half acre of ferns, my guess is it's probably bracken fern in an area that maybe was cleared of forest or something like that. And unfortunately, thistles and bracken fern are both broadleaf plants. And if you were going to use an herbicide, it would be hard to get rid of one and not the other. Um, bracken is usually pretty good at outcompeting just about anything, but thistles are quite an adversary. <laughs> and especially because I'm guessing it's most likely Canada thistle, which is a rhizomatous perennial. And unless you could do like some selective um, spot spraying, just literally only spraying the thistles, you might have a hard time getting rid of it um, without getting rid of both. And because Canada thistle is rhizomatous and so is the fern, um, they basically have rhizomes kind of intermeshed under there. And so some things that you could use that would be soil active would be, you know, hard to control. It would be affecting the roots on both of them. Um, so short of just like very carefully spot spraying an herbicide on the thistle, um, I don't think, I don't think it could be done because, you know, if you did some mechanical thing where you're going in and just like pulling out the thistles or, or weed whacking them, you'd have to do it multiple times in the season, because again, the only way mechanically to actually kill a rhizomatous plant is you'd have to prevent it from having any photosynthesis going on all season. So you'd have to keep cutting down anything green that came up. So that is a really tough problem. Um, and, and if you want the ferns, um, but you don't want the thistles, yeah, I think you would just, your best bet would be kind of going through and spot spraying carefully just on the thistles. And if you did kill some of the ferns around the thistles, you know, the ferns would that remain would probably fill back in pretty quickly. And any other questions? While we're waiting, I'm gonna put into the chat um, our sign up sheet again for the May 14th lottery. So, and so this will have a, on May 14th, we'll have an in person event in Peshastan area. And the presenters will be there and be, be looking at actual plants. And then we'll go to a home site, a new home site, and they will discuss how they would uh, landscape that area with, with native plants. So, um, again, kind of sort of a follow up on that, Julie. I have a question about if you are starting a new either starting a brand new yard or taking in a taking out part of my yard and and I want to put in native plants what do I need to do to prevent native uh, uh, from prevent weeds and invasive weeds from getting established well if you're starting from scratch and you don't have a lot of weeds or maybe you're taking out um, like some turf um, there is kind of a mulching method that works pretty well, and that would be to lay down a layer of like cardboard and newspaper, and then top that with some cardboard and then, or not cardboard, but um, compost, um, and maybe a layer of mulch on top of that. Now it kind of depends though, because that's going to be making a pretty rich um, bed, and some of our native 
plants really do better in kind of poorer soils. And um, so, but if you did that to get started and then you don't do a lot of amendments after that, um, that could work. And, it, and again, it kind of depends on how big of an area because that might not be feasible for a really big area to do it that way. Um, one way that is done commonly, you know, in a bigger area is sort of an agricultural model where you go in and use an herbicide and kill what's there and kind of start from a, a, a bare slate. And then you go back and you seed in what you want to grow from seed. And if it's mainly grasses to begin with, then if you have some broadleaf weeds that come up after that first year, you still have the option of spraying those weeds without killing your grass. <clears throat> And then you can follow it up by plugging in some forbs and shrubs like that, maybe in the end of the second, the fall of the second or third year. So depending on how, you know, how much stuff you want to get rid of and how big of an area you're working with, those are kind of the two extremes. One with like absolutely no chemicals, just using that sort of um, smother and mulch method without the solarization. So, it, you know, it ha hasn't really killed your soil in a sense. Um, or you can go with the, the herbicide, which looks drastic because everything's dead, but it's really the plants that are dead. You haven't really, you know, killed the soil. And, and that might be more effective, like if you're putting in seed to begin with rather than plugs, um, again, because you don't have that super rich soil with the compost and everything, which most of our native grass seeds um, you know, that's not the kind of soil they're well adapted for. So there's sort of two extremes there, I guess, depending on what you're doing. Any other questions? Well, so if, if not, I guess that's all. Thank you very much, Julie. So, and also we'll be, um, this was recorded and we'll put that onto our YouTube channel um i believe yep i'll put that into the chat and that'll be posted there and uh julie will get us a pdf of, of the powerpoint and then i'll email that out to everyone who's registered so thank you all very much and any last chance for questions now thank you so much julie and thanks everyone who joined us this evening All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.